Father, we come before you today asking that you would remove any hindrance to a proper comprehension and understanding of what faith is or what it means to believe. We pray that at the end of our time together here, listening to your sermon, that it might be so clear that we are going to be so excited to apply what faith is all about. And if there are needs for any correction, may be plain and simple. O oh, Holy Spirit, move in and through our lives today, we pray. May the exaltation of Christ be utmost. And Father, thank you for the grace, the ministry of the church, the wonder of fellowship, the joy of knowing you. Thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like for you to turn to Romans 4, 1 to 25. Manifestation is defined as an actual demonstration, a tangible, actual presentation of what's true. And so when we speak about faith, and in reference to how faith is manifested, it's about the primary concern that if we claim to be followers of Jesus, the question is this. When people look at us, is faith manifested? Do they see and experience a person who actually believes? Uh, John Calvin in the Institutes wrote, There is a permanent relationship between faith and the world. He goes on to say, He could not separate one from the other any more than we could separate the rays from the sun from which they come. The same word is the basis whereby faith is supported and sustained. If it turns away from the word of God, it, it fails. It falls. Therefore, take away the word and no faith will then remain. This is so important, especially in our day and age, where people claim faith as evident in their lives because it is very strong. The reason why that is of much concern is because if, if one's faith is not sourced from the wisdom of God, the Word of God, then it becomes thoroughly problematic. Because as Calvin puts it, any faith that is truncated, that is not sourced from the Word of God, is not faith at all. Quite strong words. And the reason why that is so biblical is we will set to explore the manifestation of faith today. I remember clearly on how I uh, uh, forcefully implemented this sort of quote unquote faith in my own life during my early months as a Christian. You see, I've been exposed to uh, attractive young women in, in college and I pursued them. But then when I became a follower of Jesus, when I turned to Jesus, when I received Him as my Lord and Savior, I was told that Christian women are of a different sort. And so, 
I wasted no time to make a careful observation. I was blown away by the active uh, distinction that truly there is a distinction between a, a woman who, who, uh, who follows Jesus and one who doesn't know the Lord. In particular, there was this beautiful young lady at the State University who attracted me beyond measure just because she is kind of like the icon of the University of the Philippines back in the days, the Campus Crusade for Christ. And whenever there's a group, whenever there's a group, a gathering of believers, she would always be the master of ceremonies. And when I first saw her, I said to myself, I've got strong faith. She's going to be my wife. And I sat at the back, and when I saw her, my heart palpitated, and I said, my faith is strong. That woman over there is going to be Mrs. Dewa. For, through, for, for, for two involved years of pursuit, I kid you not, my faith, quote and quote, my own version, pursued her like a hawk. And you probably know the result. No one discipled me in matters of love, courtship, and marriage, biblically. And so I had my own terms. I cut and pasted my idea on what faith is all about, and I pursued her, and what not, and nothing transpired. It was like a major hit in my walk with Jesus, uh, doubting if, if Jesus really cared for my heart. Because I was so faith driven. But the problem with that is I, I later learned in life that my version of faith could not even be validated by scriptures. Because there's nothing in scriptures that tells you that if you're single and you find you found someone that's really really attractive, like a Miss Universe that's a Christian, say Catriona Gray, who is a Christian, by the way. Uh, there's nothing in the Bible that tells you that you're watching television and you look at Catriona Gray and you say, she is a believer and I have very strong faith that that's going to be my wife. There's nothing in the scriptures that tells you that that's valid. Because if we look at scriptures, scriptures is very precise. It's mathematical precision. The, the equivalence is like that. The Word of God is so precise, especially in defining matters of faith and what believing is all about. But I'm really trying to say here is this. Believing in this day and age has come to a point where everyone defines believing Everyone defines faith according to their own taste and preferences. And so we do have quite a variety of what faith is all about, which is very problematic. So we begin with an inspection of our own version and definition of faith. So I'd like for you to be sensitive to how you would define faith yourself. And how, how, how do you actually demonstrate believing? Because you might come to terms with something that needs to be rewired or uh, altogether revamped after looking at what the Bible would say about faith. We will have to source our inspection from the Word. And if there is a chapter in scriptures, there are many chapters and books in the Bible that really would, 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 would explain and clarify faith. But I think, I think, Romans chapter 4 is probably up there in terms of the fluidity of argument on what faith and believing is all about. Of course, you've got the great chapters like Hebrews 11, 11 where you've got PowerPoints of people uh, illustrated people who are actually living by faith but in terms of logical flow in terms of making clear on what it is so that you get to inspect your own if it's the real thing or not 
we go to Romans chapter 4. Without much ado, let's go and hit the first one. The first one involves, we say we believe. Okay, we say we believe. Yes, I believe. The, the first thing that we find is this. When you say you've got faith and you believe, the Bible, the scriptures, will immediately open a concern about this word, accounting. Because biblical faith will involve a certain kind of accounting. Now, why do we say that? What then shall we say about Abraham? That's the first verse. Our forefather. What did he discover about the matter? On September uh, 2002, guess what? Abraham was the front cover of Time magazine. Uh, it, it was not a selfie of Abraham because there was no such thing before. But it was a, a sketch. But he was the time cover. Because it's granted that if you talk about religious faith, religions of over the world would conceive that no one probably would out faith Abraham. And so there was a discussion on faith and the front cover of Time Magazine uh, was Abraham. And, and, and so in verse 1 we are told, what did our father Abraham, the forefather, discover about faith? Was he justified by works or what? Well, what does the Bible say? It says in verse 3, Abraham, there you go, believed God and it was accounted, there's your word, and it was credited, it was accounted to him as righteousness. There is your word. So what transpires here is a form and a certain kind of accountancy. When you say that you believe in God immediately, if it's valid and it's the real one, suddenly there is a certain accounting that takes place. So what's being said is this. Let, let, let's try this. To, to be more practical, let, let's try this. Kuya uh, Paul, you are a very good answer, sir. But how young are you? Oh, let's talk about more pleasant things. <laughs> I'm You are? Yes. You don't look like it, so Actually, exact, exact number. 60. Oh my goodness, that is a, a good age, 63. Um, Carla? Well, it's not proper to ask girl, uh, ladies, right? I'll uh, skip you. Uh, let's see. Uh, Koi, you just got married. How old are you? 28. Oh, goodness. Your dad is 63. You are 28. Mika, you seem to be very young. So, how old are you? How young are you? 17. You got a teenager in the house. Now, I'd like for you to imagine the day of your birth. 1 to 17, and then 1 to your age, and 1 to 63. And I'd like for you to, uh, given all access, I'd like for you to do a ledger, an accounting ledger, of every year, uh, let's try this, every month, every day, okay. by the way, every second. And on the, uh, on, on the other columns, uh, uh, put down every thought, every action, everything that you ever did, both those that are hidden, the, the things that you pushed out of your memory because they're not so pleasant, everything on that ledger. And I'd like for you to conceptually freeze them here in your head. And let's pretend that I have a gadget a wire, and I'll throw it to you, Koi, I'll throw it to Mika, I'll throw it to Kuya Pa, and if they give me back my cord, I'll attach it to my computer here, as we 
it's a contribution to all of us. On a bridge. I'd like for you to imagine for a second if any one of you would be comfortable to do that. Because I guarantee you, not even Abraham would be willing to do that. Because he knows what you and I will see. Can you imagine if I show my life there on a ledger? Can you actually imagine God looking at that ledger and standing with tears in his eyes, clapping and saying, Bravo! What a life! Terrible thing is we've been tracking the book of Romans and we are told that every human life is like a filthy rag. No exception. No one is righteous. Not even Father Abraham. You get that? And what's being told here, if this is not incredible, is this. If you really believe in the gospel of Jesus, something happened to the accounting process. And what happened to the accounting process? If you give me your code, Ate Alicia, if you give me your code now, and just because I know you believe in Jesus, if I plug that cord because of your belief in Jesus, as it is solid and anchored in the gospel, if you give me a word and I'll plug it and your life will be flashed out there, you know what you will see? You will see a most holy accounting. The Father will stand up with tears in his eyes and clap and say, Alicia, <coughs> you are holy. I see my son in your life. There's not a single speck of dirt. Not a single speck of sin. Not a single speck of anything that's dirty and repugnant before the presence of God. So much so that God has the tenacity, the audacity to tell you you may now come before my throne of grace because I will listen to you. Because you are so pure. What time for accounting is that? And for that reason, Abraham is saying, I have nothing to do with this. I cannot boast any, uh, not a bit. I, I, I will not be able to take anything from this accounting process where God sees me as righteous, made right with God. I cannot stand and say, Lord, you have to thank me because that's what I did. No, there's absolutely nothing. What Abraham is saying, I believe because everything about me now I have nothing to do with it. It's everything about what God did. Because I believe. And because I believe, it was accounted to me as righteousness. Dikaiosune say you, that beautiful phrase, the righteousness of God imputed upon us. I don't know about you people, but that, if you actually, seriously process and believe that, and actually walk like it, it will not only change your game on a daily basis, but it will provide a radical way of demonstrating your life before a world that's longing for holiness. But the problem with that is more often than not, we are scared of the serpent who keeps on accusing us that we are not who we are. Remember the image last Sunday of Michael the Archangel stepping on the head of the serpent who is constantly wiggling. But the, the image goes for as long as you step on the head of the accuser, the serpent, it will not be able to harm you. But we are told that the accuser will not stop. 
trying to tear the church, trying to tear you, trying to accuse you, trying to bring up matters that you've done in the past, your propensities, your flaws, your weaknesses, trying to bring you up just to paralyze you. But for long, for as long as you're stepping on the head of the serpent, all that he can do is to wiggle while you stand on the truth that your accounting has been settled by God. You have a clean and holy and righteous standing before God, if you believe in Jesus. <coughs> The second thing that we find delightful in, in, in the flow, that by the way, if we can only have half day in exploring Romans 4, we can do that, but we don't have time for that, so we will have to feature the salient points. The, the next important point in my estimate that needs to be highlighted is the matter of assurance. You are familiar with insurance to be sure. There is a remarkable difference between insurance or assurance, although you might say that that's merely semantics, but there is. Insurance is profit-oriented, it's given. Insurance is given because there is a vested <coughs> interest on what you can provide. And what could be more true than uh, the current corporate insurance firms, you know? You provide your responsibility for payments, your monthly payments, and what is their responsibility and their promise. Their promise is, you are going to be in good hands. You are in good hands. Hmm? Whether it's progressive or, uh, or whatever, Gaito, State Farm, uh, they all promise the same and one trying to outdo the promise of the other. But then we all know that they're really, uh, they do have an agenda. It's, it's corporate profit. That's the agenda. And it's this for that. Huh? Uh, that's insurance. The distinction between insurance and assurance is the covenant aspect of the one who provides assurance. Marriage is never called an insurance policy, but it's an assurance between two people that they will stay together because of the covenant aspect of marriage. In Pampango, uh, Tita Kathy, are you here? Yes? I'm going to mention something. I'd like to see the effect of this that I'm going to say in your face. Just because I'm a Pampangan and you're a Pampangan, I will say this and I'd like for you to demonstrate if this is how it will affect in your face, I want to see it. You say this to God, and this is what you say. Kaku ka ke kaku. <laughs> is that sweet, Ate? Oh, let me repeat that. Uh, Ate, you're kapampangan, right? Ate? Ate, me? Yes, let me say it again to you. And Gemma, I'll say this again to you. You're kapampangan, both. Kaku ka ke kaku. Is that a sweet thing when you say that to God? Absolutely. Th there cannot be in the Kamampangan language, there cannot be any two sweeter. Right, Adorno? There cannot be two sweeter phrases in our vernacular than those two words. Kaku ka ke kaku. What's that? Is that Hawaiian? <laughs> but, 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 but what's being said is when we believe it is this. I am yours, and you are mine. Kakuka ke kaku. Huh? <laughs> but when you say that, you cannot just say, you know, I'm promising you something and, and, and whatnot. But, but when you say kakuka ke kaku, what you're trying to tell the other person, you know what, I'm promising uh, myself. I'm not promising something that I'll do for you. I'm promising myself to you. Now, when you come to think of the ultimate covenant, what's that? It's the gospel of Jesus. Because the gospel of Jesus is this provides a blessed assurance. Why is it called the blessed assurance? Because the Father is not only saying they will take care of you. That the Father will redeem you. That the Father will make things okay for you. No, He did not 
merely say that. He said something that includes all of the things that that are that are inclusive of an assurance. What is this? You know what? I'm going to give myself for you. Did he actually do that? The Father sent his one and only Son to take your place so that your accounting process will be altered radically. How? Well, he takes the wrath of the Father to himself. And then he imputes. Huh? He does not bleed his righteousness to you. He imputes it like it's yours. All the medals of Jesus picture this. All the medals, all, all the goodness of Jesus, like if Jesus is a soldier and he has all these medals, it's yours. That's imputation. It's, it's, it's like you can, now, you can now face the Father and the Father looks at you and the merits of Jesus are all on you because they're fully imputed. He looks at you and says, you are my child. How can that even happen if there's no work of imputation? But it happens. Why? Because assurance took place. The Father did not only say it. He did something about it. He gave Himself to you. Ke kaku, kakuko. That's amazing. No other religion does that. Period. They can say whatever they want to. You can invent whatever religion you want to. But there is no God who's going to offer Himself to you other than Jesus. And what's happening here, this is amazing. Even Abraham was a beneficiary of the amazing substance of faith. The Lord Jesus died on the cross of Calvary 2,000 years ago, but that reality, the substance of Abraham's faith, of course, was the Lord Jesus. The righteousness that was imputed to Abraham, of course, is nothing more and nothing less but the Son of God's righteousness. Although he was born before the earthly Messiah arrived. That's assurance. If that is true again, and if that is what you believe again, okay. what does that mean? It's almost Good Friday. Let, we are entering the Lent season. And I, I am picturing in my head uh, what's almost like a festival in, in San Domingo, Pampanga, where I hail from. Because on the Lenten seasons, the, the, the landscape, the social landscape of my town changes drastically. There is, there is the, uh, the passion where there is a, uh, that the, the, the gospel is translated in, in our dialect and it is sang by all women. But it's very pressing because that's all that you hear. Uh, and then it takes a head on Friday, on a good Friday, because that's where the flagellants would, would do their part. Flagellants are, are, are men uh, who really believe uh, sincerely that they can pay uh, for the penalty of their sins by stripping their... their, 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 their they remove their shirts and then they they have these uh, wooden whips, wooden whips, and 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 they do that for for hours, for four hours in a blistering hot summer, and, and and they do that while their backs are pierced with with broken glasses, and and I go there, I go there uh, every year. It, it's like a festival. I, I go there early to watch all this prep. I love the prep because you see all the men uh, preparing their backs to be bloodied like that and then they form a line. This is back in the days when AIDS was even 
presented as something of a reality, but they would fall in line with their covered faces and they would, next! And then there was this uh, man who was a, a, a broken glass paddle, <laughs> like that, and suddenly the, the, the blood would squirt like that, and, and they would just go like that. And, 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 and it was, it was like a, 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 a most bizarre experience, but uh, it, it won't compare to the main star of the Good Friday presentation. At least in Barangay Kutud, where crucifixion happens, the reenactment of, of, of uh, the crucifixion happens, where Bob, the uh, uh, Bob, the star, uh, is a uh, uh, firefighter. Annually, Bob shows up and gets crucified. He has a hole already and gets punctured every year. I think he, get, he gets paid 500 pesos back in the days. And so we already know his face. He looks like Jesus, actually. He has a wig and whatnot. And, and, but then, on one particular year, I go there early, and Bob was not there. He had a flu. So he was absent. And we thought, oh my goodness, Bob's not here. And there was a young Turk. And his father was with him. And, and guess what? Th this is true, okay? I'm not making this up. The young, the young teenager, I think he was a teenager, was tied, of course, you've got to be tied like that because he's big. Tied, his feet was big, uh, tied, and he was tied like that. And they, he was on the ground, and they hit that nail. <sighs> and then he, he screamed. And of course they hoisted it. And he said, Why are you laughing? 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 This is something to be serious. Why are you laughing? Because it's laughable. You know what's that? Tata, he said, Father, give me down, give me down, it's so painful. It was like comedy. Because there's this man who was pretending to be like Jesus, and he could bear the pain, and he was asking his dad to take him down because it's really excruciating. We can see him struggling like that until he passed away. I said, Oh, and Jesus died. But it was insane because this is the most comic of all proportions because. A man is trying to imitate Jesus. It is the most insane because it is so off from what we know. How can a man like that prepare an assurance for you? But when the God who made the universe, who runs everything in this universe, by the way, who ex nihilo can say something and it will happen. Let me repeat that. How do you, how, how do you conceptually think of this? A being who from nothing just speaks something and it happens. That's Jesus. Dies on the cross and takes our sins, takes our weaknesses and declares, I'm making you clean. I'm going to take your place. I'm going to give you blessed assurance and all that I'm asking you believe in me. It's beyond the no other religion can, can match, even come close, to the amazing, amazing wonder of what just happened to those who believe in Jesus. Blessed assurance. It's not something fake. It is the wonder of all wonders. So you got, you got assurance. You're accounting before God is settled because of the blessed assurance. But then, this third thing is crucial. You say you believe, but uh, you say you believe, but Abraham is now going to demonstrate. You know, faith actually requires a certain kind of alliance. If Jesus is the head, and he calls you to be the body of Christ. There cannot be any sort of detachment that can take place to Christ. And every part of the body should be allied to the body members. So there is a crucial reality that if you say that you believe in Jesus, this should be demonstrated in your life. 
that clearly you are attached to the head, whatever the head says, you simply obey because you know you're in good hands, whatever the head says, with that kind of wisdom, infinite, whatever the head says, spoken clearly in his word, you do it. And then when the word says, you have to function and ally with others. You cannot isolate yourselves. When you say you follow me, you have to be with the others. There has to be an alliance. And so what do we read? Is the blessedness only for the Jews? No, no, no. It's all for all. It's for the Gentiles. It's, they are also given this kind of allow, uh, accountancy. They are also given uh, this kind of assurance. Now, the promise comes by faith. We find in verse 16, so that it may be by grace and it may be guaranteed to all of Abraham's offspring. Uh, this was this promise. We, 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 we are told that if you believe in Jesus, uh, your life is going to be pregnant with promise. And at the core of the promise of God towards Abraham it is this. You will be the heir to the nations, because out from you, your own body, you will be the father of many nations. And the seed will come from you. And that's the Lord Jesus, we know that. That's, and, and we are told in, in verse 18, look at the alliance here, against all hope, Abraham in hope believed, and so he actually became the father of many nations because he believed, but how did he believe? Here is where the alliance part comes in. Without weakening in his faith. Remember that? Without the, the Greek word is without staggering in his faith. Mm. You know how it is when you stagger? Without staggering in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old. And that Sarah's womb was already dead, yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God. I'd like for you to understand this. Faith does not deny the present realities of impossibilities. Abraham was called by God in no uncertain terms. That although almost a hundred, he is going to be a daddy. <laughs> he looked at the mirror and saw a hundred year old man. And he didn't stop there. He recognized how weak he was. And he did not hide it. The Bible says that he faced it eyeball to eyeball. He did not deny it. And then he turned next to them and he saw his wife. Not far from a hundred, give or take ninety-four. Looked at her, she was still sleeping probably with wrinkles. And, and she did not hide the fact that that womb was no longer capable. Now this is where faith faces a crisis. Because aren't we in the same boat? Is there other matters in our lives where we are sure for certain that God wants us to do this? But then we are paralyzed. You know why? We are par paralyzed by some reality. God, you are asking me to do this, but I am 100 years old. Nah. Hindi lang 100 years old. Nah, Lord. Si is 93 na. And you're saying that we're going to have a baby and we're going to be the father to the nations <clears throat> in Dino Pede, Lord. That's what we say. And we get paralyzed. What is your version of that? Do you have, for certain, matters that God wants for you to do but you're paralyzed? You're not willing to move forward because you're looking at 
the reality, and you try. To your credit, you brushed it aside. Siguro you swept it under the carpet, and you tried your own efforts, and you were frustrated because it's really not going to happen. Guess what? Abraham chose not to do that. We are told he actually looked at it fair square in the eye and says, "Yes, I know. I'm a hundred years old. Yes, I know." The womb of my wife is no longer functional. It's actually literally dead. But because you said it. Huh. And you're the God who operates ex nihilo. From nothing. Just say the word and I shall be healed. What matters most now, O oh God, is that I am in alliance with the greatest power in the universe. You just say the word. If I see it in your word and it's being directed to me, not my will, but your word be done. I'd like for you to process this for a second. Because if you're fully aligned to this kind of faith, I wonder what kind of life you will be living and what kind of impact and influence you will be having on the people who are closest to you, even your neighbors, strangers who will be observing your life. If you are submitted to this kind of faith and belief, can you imagine the impact? And no wonder those who took God seriously, those who are continuously taking God seriously, since time, since the time of their introduction to the faith, even to this day, even if the biblical community church aren't being most impacted by people who really follow the steps of how Abraham leveraged his belief in God this way. Having said that, I'd like to uh, provide a singular challenge. So how do we go? This is what it is actually. Bottom line is this. If you get all this, that now that you're making personal assessments of where you are in your personal faith, and you say you believe Jesus, but let's Really put that on the litmus test. Yeah, you say you believe Jesus. How's the accounting process? Do you live like one? Is there a holy gate? Is there a holy stature when you are with other people? So much so that they see godliness. It's all over you. And, 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 when, and, and we are, when you're out there, the accounting process makes you... Uh, what happened in your accounting, you know, provides your most unusual identity. A and then your assurance is there are many problems. Uh, coronavirus, it, it does not, it, it, you never hide from it. You still do your stuff. You, you still wash your hands and whatnot. You still get on the mask. But the way you handle coronavirus is different from the regular person. You know why? And people ask, you know, you're different. You're not panicking and whatnot. Why? And you talk about your blessed assurance. And it's not only coronavirus. Do you have a present issue in your life that things are falling apart and it's broken down? But what is your assurance? Because if your assurance comes from the infinite resource of God, there is absolutely no room for panic. Absolutely no room because no, there is not a single concern in your life that's no longer covered, and it's not the man from from uh, the insurance firm that tells you you're good hands. No, it's the it's the king who says, "I will never leave you, nor forsake you." When does it have a time frame? No, until the end of the ages. That's blessed assurance. So, 
and, and, and then of course, the alliance. This is the most important thing. The alliance to the head, that's uh, vertical. And the wisdom of God, that the expression of provision as it comes from Him will have to be done, listen, this way, horizontally, through the body of Christ. He will use His children to supply what's needed. Emotional push, physical push, resource push, whatever push. It's not some figment of some imagination, some cosmic relief, but it's here. The prayer meeting is a testimony. That's why I, 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 you will always hear this from me like a broken record. The prayer meeting is here to generate this kind of awareness full time real space and time that you actually are able to connect in real time and real space and, and, and provide an, a, a venue where you actually pour out a concern in your life and someone, a real, actual person who is a member of the body of Christ receives it and the two of you wait in wonder. <clears throat> Do you, would you allow me just one specimen? <laughs> uh, the Talagets, I know David Pope won't because he declared this in the prayer meeting. The Talagets have been without a home for more than a month, more than two months. Is that more than two months or a little bit? Since December. Just because of an issue in the kitchen. And uh, it's been most difficult, you know. How can you conceptually think that you're not living in your house? And that you're being moved from one hotel to another? Just because they want to say <laughs> there are some issues, they relocate you and whatnot. And you know, you know how difficult it is for construction, especially with the problem that they have, the entire house is involved. And this can really be long. But the brother came to the prayer meeting uh, a week ago and was asking for covering, for wisdom on what to do, because it, the process is very slow. But he was very thankful that they're like living in a dream. It's like he's not complaining. He's just living in a dream. He says, what, what could be better than living in a hotel where your towels are clean every day? And, uh, and, and, and you know, we have three televisions. Huh? One for every person. Uh, what could be better than that? But I know it's not real. He said, so I tried for covering because I want to expedite the process. And then he said, and then we just realized uh, that, that things are really challenging uh, with, with our place there. You know, uh, where David Telagi lives is, is actually a very good area, prime, but uh, things are, are a little bit challenging because you know how, how it is in this day and age. Uh, and so some, every now and then David and I would have discussions. Uh, probably because my parents are aging, maybe I should relocate. I should relocate. But you know for a fact, Tell me if this is not a miracle. Uh, we know for a fact that the house of David Talali and Kujon Erlinda was the former house of our senior pastor before I was senior pastor, the person who started the biblical community church, who is now in heaven, Dr. Pantal. That was his house. But then he died. But then he was so good in, in allowing the Talagits just to continue the payments and whatnot. So there was discussion, David was saying, please pray because I need to maybe make, uh, maybe uh, get a loan and whatnot, but there's a problem because uh, it has to be in our name. 
and there's a process, you know, my uncle died, and how do you even start that process? So, so we were with him, and with, with the three of us actually, this was just last week, we prayed, and, and we felt the Lord and mercy and David, this process has to start, so I even told one of the guys to help him out. Make, start the process, transfer the property. So, I don't know how this works. So we pray because you know, in order to get a loan, you have to own the house and whatnot. And we, you know what happened? At the prayer meeting last week, this is, the, this is just one week, our incredible wonder. That I told David, don't even investigate, let's just be joyous. So David, uh, you know, asked a brother to help in the process, and the brother was there seeking help. So they got into another person, they were ready to do power of attorney, and they looked at the property, ready to execute the power of attorney and do whatever is needed to transfer the ownership from the dead uncle to them. And so they feed it on the address, <coughs> feed it on the address, and the owner shows up. Jose and Erlinda Tanaki. And so the, the person who's trying to help him says, what do you want again? A power of attorney for Jose and Erlinda Tanaki. So, wh why do you need it? Well, it's not in their, it's not in the title, it's not, they're not the owner. What do you mean? It's here. They're the owners. And they looked at it. They are the owners. <laughs> and, 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 yeah, they're the owners. And, and I, how in the world did that happen? So we told David, stop. You are the owners. <laughs> and, and, and too, he tried it. He didn't cut out alone. He, he can. Because they're the owners. Now tell me how in the world did that happen? Because to their recollection, there was no move in their part. <clears throat> now, is this consistent, however, with the God who said, Do you know who you are allied with? Do you know that I only have to think it and it's going to happen? That's just one specimen. And God can't wait for you to experience who He is and why He had to send His Son. Because He can't wait to show the world His glory. And His glory is best seen when we obey. Yeah. And so, here is the deal. That if you take this seriously, observe what I believe, that's what it is. Like for you to, to go out there and if you believe in Jesus, be intentional and say this to yourself. I will now live life and I will make sure that the people around me will observe what I believe beginning today. And you know what's going to happen? The glory of God will be seen. And you think God's going to stop blessing you? <laughs> There's anything that God delights in this. Obedient children, so that He can bless them, so that His glory gets exalted. That is what faith, biblical faith, according to God's Word, is all about. I pray for your people, oh God, if they say they believe in Jesus, allow us to observe the glory that comes out from you. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.